Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm a few minutes late this because I was trying to enter the lab reports grades. I finished them last minute, finished a few things, huh? Yes, so after I grade the exam, uh, what I'll do is I'll put the grades so far, so it will be like halfway through the semester, so you know where you are mid-semester. So I'll do that as soon as the exam two is uh, graded, uh, exam one is graded. Mallory, listen. Sampling procedure. You'll get all extra credits at the end of the semester. I have everything you turned in, and usually at the end of the semester, I will distribute the extra credit. So you'll see them towards the end. Yeah. They're just extra credits. So on Moodle, you will see an extra credit column that will be entered there at the end of the semester. Um, Okay, so the extra credit and also the plus five at any random day. Chelsea's gonna tell me how many is, uh, are missing today. So we'll see if today's the day. If Pam wants to be mean, today the day. If Pam wants to be nice, I will wait when everybody's in the class. <laughs> Doesn't want to. Okay, one other thing I wanna make a comment. Please guys talking here. Thank you. Okay, another thing I want to make a comment on is your lab reports. I've noticed such an improvement in almost everybody. So I appreciate that you're following instructions, you're doing a great job. Uh, so far we have graded about five lab reports. So far I just have a couple more uh, atomic absorption ones. But keep doing what you're doing. All right. Um, so. From now on, the half of the semester is going to be really applicable uh, tests on um, and characterization of food products, and it will be a lot of calculations. So the first half of the semester was a lot of techniques and tools you had to learn, chromatography, spectroscopy, mass spectrometry. Um, so, but from this section onward, it will be a lot of understanding principles of different methods and doing a lot of calculations. So, uh, but this is the practical part of food analysis, though it will be more relatable and hopefully a little bit not too bland. It wasn't, check under week seven or week eight. The week before, la last week, I thought I put everything there. Um, really? It's not under week seven, week. It's under week seven. What about week eight? Week eight, two was a master's year. Only? Dang. Okay. All right, so I'm not perfect, although I wish I were. Um, let me do that really quick so that those of you that follow Uh, okay, this is going to take a moment. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So which week are we on? Are we week eight or week nine? Your guess is as good as mine, girl. It's it is nine. Okay. Yeah. Time is flying.
six missing? With Megan, but I'm assuming she's missing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. slow, aren't I? Okay, it's up. Thank you. I love compliments. Thank you. Keep them coming. Okay. All right. We are going to start for real. Okay, so proximate analysis. Moisture content is part of proximate analysis, but I want to, we didn't introduce that before Ted's lecture, so I'm going to introduce it now. So from, what do we mean by proximate analysis? Can anybody guess without looking at notes? When we say proximate analysis, what are we proximating? Riley. Whatever, anything? Okay, we approximate the amount of fat. What other analysis falls under proximate analysis? I just said moisture, said fat, protein, ash, carbohydrates. So the macronutrients fall under proximate analysis. So here they are. So 100% is basically the percentage of moisture, percent of ash, fat, protein, and total carbohydrate. We call it proximate because all of the methods we use are crude methods of determination. So when we do Keldal or do mass for protein, or what you did in the lab this week, you did ash and fat, it's crude, it's not exact, because the fat content might be underestimated due to the type of solvent you've used, or, under, or overestimated slightly if the procedure was not that accurate. So it is not the exact amount of fat, it's the approximate amount of fat that you, you get from Mojiner and from Soxlet. Same with ash. Sometimes your ashing is not complete. Your, your ash is not always white and beautiful like snow. It's going to have some um, gray matter or some dark matter. That means your carbonic matter has not been completely incinerated. So they're all approximation of the, to of the different macronutrients. So which of these components you will find on the nutritional label? Justin. Yes. Total carbohydrate is one, Molly. Fat. Fat is another. Protein is another. That's it. Huh? No, no, no. Out of all of these. Of these five, what else? Do you see fiber here? Total carbohydrate, that includes fiber and starch and sugars. Okay. So do you find moisture, ash? No, we don't. So there's the total fat, total carbohydrate, total protein out of the different proximate analysis that we do. But, but we need to analyze all of these for Nutrition label, why? Any guesses on why? No. You don't know, which I expect that you don't know, except try, you want to give it a chance. <laughs> Between bites.
you need the moisture, ash, fat, and protein to determine total carbohydrate. Because the total carbohydrate, you don't use any of the methods we're going to talk about later in a couple of uh, lecture times for uh, approximation of total carbohydrate. Why is that? Because I want to draw a pie chart. This is your food. You will have slice for moisture, ash, protein, fat, and total carbohydrate. So you determine moisture, ash, protein, and fat. You want to make sure that the sum is 100. So you subtract everything from 100, you get the total carbohydrate. If you determine, there's no one method, we'll learn that later, there's no one method that will get you accurately total carbohydrate. There is a good method for sugars, a method for starch, a method for dietary fiber, but there is not one method that will give you the total carbohydrate. So we get it by difference. And if we measure starch alone and dietary fiber alone and sugars alone, we might get maybe this much carbohydrate or maybe this much because each method carries its own error. So we end up either with over 100% or under 100%. So we, can, we don't want that. We want everything to add up to 100. So we have official methods for moisture, ash, protein, protein, and fat. Therefore, we get the total carbohydrate by difference. For the label, in order to get dietary fiber, it would be a dietary fiber method. In order to get sugars, it would be a sugar-specific method. OK. One thing I want to say is we use official methods of analysis for determining these different components for the nutrition label. Fat, specifically, Soxit and Mojainer are official methods, but they're not the one used for labeling. To get the exact fat content for labeling, we use the FAME method that you have done in the lab. With that, you get the concentration of every fatty acid, and you convert it to triglycerides. So you get the concentration of C4 to C24, and then you add glycerol to every three fatty acid. By calculation, you get the total fat. And that's the FDA way of approved way to get the fat content that is listed on the label, not Soxlet and Mojina. And that's why I have it here in red. But we do use them in lab to see approximately if it's similar to what is reported uh, on the label. So, and that's just showing you that this is how we get the total carbohydrate when we analyze each of the other components. Okay. So, we're moving on to ash. So today we'll cover ash. Friday we're going to cover fat. On Monday, I'm not going to be here. So, lab and lecture are canceled. No, of course not. <laughs> so they're not canceled. Very cruel. Um, <laughs> don't we have to be cruel sometimes? It's Halloween. Yesterday was Halloween. We have to be cruel. Okay. So Chelsea is going to give the protein lecture on Monday. So you are in good hands. She knows what she's doing. And then the lab will be... Um, well covered as well with our wonderful TAs and Cindy. You won't miss me much. Don't cry. Okay. What's the definition of ash? Billy. It's all the non-organic Everything that is not organic. Are vitamins organic? Yes. They are. So again, a common mistake of students when we say, what's the component of ash? They say vitamins and minerals. No. 
It's only the minerals and any inorganic residue that winds up in your sample. So if you have a contamination of soil, sand in your sample, it, wi it will wind up in the ash. Any inorganic matter, but we hope that that is not the case. You don't have soil in your sample. It will be all coming from minerals. So here's some animation to what actually happens. Um, so using high temperature, we're going to incinerate all the organic matter, and what remains is your inorganic matter. <laughs> what do you don't get it? OK. <laughs> An organic matter. Yeah, so dragon give you a very hot flame. Yeah. It totally makes sense. Yeah, doesn't it really? What is in there? That's your white ash. Not a vomit. It's white ash. That's what you want to keep look, the ash looks like. What? This is the first year that you guys don't get the animation. What? Isn't it clear? No? Okay, never mind. Um, why, why is it important to determine ash content? Why do we care about ash? Huh? No, I didn't, but go ahead. Yes. So actually in flower, one of the quality parameters is determining ash to determine if you have with your flower, you will have sand and soil. So it's a good quality parameter for, for flower. So in, in organic matter that doesn't come from the actual sample, that's a good answer. The other one was good too is you want to ash the samples in order you want to do mineral content um, evaluation or quantification. The other one we just said at the beginning of lecture. Yes, we need to determine everything else. So it's part of proximate analysis for nutrition label. So we need to determine everything else so that we can get the total carbohydrate and complete our nutrition label. And preparation, do you know Popeye? Don't tell me you yeah. don't know Popeye. Kate is shaking. You don't know Popeye? Popeye the sailor man. Toot toot. No? <laughs> what? So he eats spinach the whole time in the cartoon. He opens up his spinach and then they, he gets the power because of the iron in the spinach. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany just got it. Okay, preparation step for specific element analysis. I love this lecture, it's so simple. I needed just to make it a little bit fun. Okay, um, so sample preparation. Some of you had cheese uh, samples, right? So we had to pre-dry those samples because you don't want spattering. Uh, when, once you put the sample in and the temperature starts to rise and the rate of the temperature that rises in the muffle furnace is high, at which the temperature rises is high, so you might wind up splattering the sample and that would mean losses and underestimation. So drying of high moisture food is often uh, done before you ash. Obviously, many of you had to mill or grind the samples. So those of you that had almonds, and even those that had the dry cheese, you had to run them through, except for Parmesan uh, cheese. So reduce the size to a mesh number of 20. Um, that is optimal. We didn't measure the mesh, but we technically, if we're doing this for official, official measurements, we have to grind and make sure we have the right particle size. Um, problem with that is contamination. So if we're using a metal uh, container in our grinder, you might get some metal elements that might cause an overestimation of certain metals like iron, for example, or steel. Um, so 
and that might increase the percentage of ash and also increase the content of particular elements. So that we do it with caution. We have to keep that in mind as a source of error. It would be great if we can extract fat from high fat samples like cheeses, for example, but instead what we did is we um, heated them on the hot plate in the lab to have the fat smoke out before we actually put it. Because if we put them in the muffin furnace as such, again, the fat will bubble and smoke and might take some particles with it outside of the crucible. So again, you might lose sample, you end up under estimation. Uh, sugar products or products high in sugar, it's advisable again to put it either in a water bath or um, on a hot plate to allow the sugar to slowly start burning instead of uh, causing foam when temperature rises very fast in the muffled furnace. Um, so cheeses, plant material, and meat all are high in moisture, so drying is um, a pre preparation step. So ashing methods, so we do dry ashing, which we did in the lab, to determine the total percent ash. So dry ashing, you can get actually physically an ash that you can weigh, so you can get percent ash, and you can solubilize, like you did for the atomic absorption lab, to do the mineral analysis of calcium and iron. Wet ashing, can you get percent ash, a physical percent ash? You can't because you take your sample, of course you weigh it, but you take your sample and you solubilize it in acid and the acid remains in your sample so there is no way you can get a dry ash content. So we, do, we never use wet ashing to determine percent ash. We use wet ashing if we are only looking for minerals and specifically minerals that could volatilize using dry ashing. Microwave ashing, it's not an official method, but has been validated uh, with official uh, drying, dry ashing method using the muffle furnace. And you can do dry ashing in microwave and you can do wet ashing. And we'll talk about the benefits of each. <clears throat> So this is a much nicer muffle furnace than what you saw in the lab, but it does the same job. It's just newer. Um, and they come in different sizes too. So some will fit up to 12 samples, the ones that you saw in the lab, and this will fit fewer. So it depends on what, if it's an industry, how many samples they need to run per day. And it is an expensive unit, but once you obtain it, it's there, it will last forever almost. Um, so dry ashing, typical temperatures use 500 to 500 degrees C. You can go higher if you don't, if, you, if let's say iron and copper is, or zinc are present in very low concentration, you don't worry about uh, volatilization, you can go higher than that and get the sample ashed in shorter amount of time. Now, you have different options for the crucibles. In the lab, you use porcelain crucible, which are the cheapest and most commonly used. So the, you use this one here. And uh, often used in teaching, often used if you are uh, working, let's say, in a flour mill and you're analyzing samples left and right all day. So you, don't, you want something cheap. And they are durable, They're, they uh, can withstand high temperature, even up to 900 degrees C, you, you can, they can withstand um, high temperature, but if it's really using them at high temperature all the time, they will break um, easily. If you use them at 500 to 550 C, they will last, again, almost forever. Now, more expensive is the quartz, which withstand really high temperature for extended period of time. It's very durable with high acid foods, not so much alkaline, but they are expensive. Quartz fiber, these are disposable. So they're made up of quartz, and the benefit of them is really good circulation of heat. You can get uh, the temperature rise, uh, rises quicker, and you can get ashing done quicker, but they're disposable. Once you use them, you throw them away. It could be um, a lot of expense 
that we want to consider. Uh, the cheapest, actually cheaper than porcelain, is the steel. But the problem with steel, although it would stand higher temperature for a longer period of time, the problem of it, of it is contamination of metal. So you will have um, iron, cadmium, steel, um, lead that would contaminate your sample. So the best of all is the platinum. So this would stand high temperature, acid, alkali, it will last forever, but it's the most expensive, and you rarely find it in labs. So advantages and disadvantages, like everything, uh, we have advantages, it's safe if you are Careful, you put your samples in when the muffled furnace is cold. You take your samples out when the muffled furnace is cold. So you turn it off, you wait a couple of hours, and then take them off. If you follow procedure, you'll be um, well off, safe. You don't need attention um, to give it attention. So you basically put your sample, turn it on and leave, turn it off and take samples off, so that minimal uh, amount of time. No reagents, no blanks, nothing, very simple. And many samples can be analyzed uh, all at once if you have a good space in your muffled furnace. Disadvantages, lengthy. You have to wait, you have to put your sample, wait, cup, turn it on, wait a couple of hours to get to 500 overnight, wait until it cools down, and then take out your samples. So lengthy. Expensive equipment to start with. And then you, have, you run into the risk of volatilizing some minerals that are volatile. Okay, everything we have from now on, think about sources of errors. What are sources of errors in dry ashing? You've done dry ashing in the lab, so what can you think of? Lauren, you were saying something? No? Huh? Over ashing, yeah, so if you ash, for a long period of time, higher temperature, you might lose your copper, zinc, and, and, uh, and iron. You might get underestimation of your ash content. Okay, other than that. If you don't ash enough, you end up overestimating because you'll be weighing some of the organic matter. What else? Contamination, like we said, depending on where you uh, grind your sample. And sometimes if you are, um, your sample, you're grinding in a, a grinder and you don't do pulse grinding, you heat up your sample, some of the moisture get lost in the sample, you're concentrating all other constituents by having that before you weigh your sample. So you don't take the weight of the sample into account. So the sample lost moisture during drying, then you end up overestimating ash. Now the one thing that is common for any type of analysis is did you homogenize your sample? Was the sample a good representative of the lot? That's always something you want to list as a source of error. From now on, this is common to any type of NS. All right, let's do some calculations. I would like you to pull out a piece of paper for a plus two. I'm, I'm gonna be mean today. What you
All right, baby. I'd like you to think about this and give it a go because this is going to be the rest of your life and for the analysis. <laughs> I would like all of you to try and get to a number. You get points for effort. This is four plus two. Yeah? Is that your question? Oh, well, just give it a go. I'll, I'll tell you a little secret later at the end of the semester. And then maybe a courageous person will come up and do it at the board. Come on, don't give up. You think you did it? Great. Do you want to come up and do it on the board? Yay. It doesn't matter. A for effort. I want to see some writing. Okay. So is this multiplied by this over 100? Yeah. This times this over 100? Yeah, it's not right. I think it, to get this number, these should be flipped, right? This, you start with a smaller number, so you multiply by a bigger number to get that. Wait, so it should be times 100 divided by? By this. You will get that number, right? I don't know. Oh, no. Oh, then no. You want 100 minus 27 in the denominator? In the denominator, you will get a different number. And this should just be 100. By 100, yeah. Because then this will be your dry matter. It will be the yeah. ash on a dry matter times 100. You'll get, what's the value for this one? You'll get. 2.15 percent. The mo moisture on dry bases is only a labuza thing. It, it doesn't really, it doesn't really sink in my head to get to calculate moisture per dry matter. So dry matter doesn't have moisture in it. So. So basically what you, you do is you have 1.14, you have 1.14 grams of ash over 53 grams of solid multiplied by 100. So the ash per your solid, okay, per the amount of solid, that's what's dry matter it will give you this value, 2.15, okay? So the ash in grams in dry matter times 100 will give you the percent ash. Remember, when you do the calculation, something to uh, see if you have kind of a correct answer. On dry bases, your percentage is always bigger than your wet bases because you are dividing by a smaller number than 100. Right? 
So dry bases is always bigger than wet bases. That would be a good check for you to see if you did the calculation correct. When you convert from wet to dry, you'll get a higher percentage. When you convert from dry to wet, you'll get a lower percentage. So when you're doing the math for um, determining ash and fat in your dried cheese samples, you'll get values on dry bases. To convert them to wet, you will get a lower percentage. So keep that in mind, and vice versa. Okay. All right, so what is the ash on fat-free bases? Note that I gave you the fat percent on dry bases. I gave it on dry, not on wet. So the step that you need to do first is what? Convert the fat content to wet bases and then be able to calculate percent ash on fat-free bases. It will be the same principle as calculating on dry bases. So instead of removing the moisture content from this equation, you will be removing the fat content. Okay? So what, before that, you need to convert this to wet bases. So how do you convert, this is something that you're going to do for your Soxlet fat determination. Say you got in processed cheese, well, I'm, this is hamburger, but let's say in processed cheese you got a certain amount of fat, how are you going to convert it from dry to wet? What would be the equation in this case? Anybody? Do you have something, Julia? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So you have 56 grams. No. 56. So it's 56.6 grams per 100 grams solid matter. That's what it's telling you. So it's 56.6 grams of fat in 100 grams of solid matter, right? But you want it using the dry, the wet basis, so you multiply that by 100 minus 47. So this equation over there will be flipped, okay? So then this will be, huh? Okay, so 30. So your fat is 30% on wet basis. So now, if I want to calculate percent ash on fat-free basis, because let's say what we said earlier, a preliminary step for meat is to defat, because it's high in fat. So if you defat, then you will get a value on fat-free basis, and you want to convert it to actual basis. Okay, so we need to understand that as well. So you, the same equation as dry basis, but what will happen here is you have 1.14 in 100 minus 30. So that's the fat free. Okay, everything without the fat times 100. You'll get your value. Okay. So that's that. The first equation, the second equation. Okay. Any questions? Now the time, because you're going to do all of these calculations for your lab report. 
the silence, I will assume that all of you know. Yes, yes, we never use dry basis moisture only in isotherm, right? Yeah, you, you always assume your moisture is on wet basis moisture. Except for in your lab calculations for the moisture lab, you had to calculate on dry basis as well. But in any other calculations beyond that, it's irrelevant. You need moisture on wet basis. All right, so wet ashing, and this is, we are using it, Please make note of the red color here, is that preparation for specific mineral analysis not for determination of total ash. Okay, so in this here you don't need high temperature, you don't incinerate at 500 degrees C, you use concentrated acids. A combination usually is used either nitric perchloric, perchloric is a very corrosive acid and require a very specific hood. We call them perchlo perchloric hoods. Um, we probably have one in the entire department. But, so it is very corrosive, very dangerous, or sometimes it's a combination of sulfuric and nitric acid. So hot plate, 200 degrees C under the hood, so the sample is going to burn. You know, you have temperature and you have corrosive acid, your organic matter is going to burn off, oxidize into fumes. So your sample will turn black color most of the time and then you can start seeing fumes coming out. That's your organic matter oxidizing into CO2, NO2, SO2, and of course water vapor. Then you know when the digestion is over when you have really clear to straw color, yellow color solution then all your organic matter is gone and what's remaining in the acid is your minerals. And then you would go f do a specific dilution that is needed for the um, determination of concentration. You need, since it's a, you're using reagents, reagents can be contaminated, you always have to do a blank, the, way, the same way you did for a mineral determination. Whenever there are glassware, and different agents used, you always need a blank. The blank contains everything but your sample. So again, disadvantages and advantages. Advantages, minerals remain in solution. You don't have volatilization uh, occurring. And then the oxidation time is short because you're combi combining temperature, high temperature, with corrosive acid. So it doesn't take overnight to digest the sample. Disadvantage, you really need to have constant operator attention. You're always there. You need to be familiar with the protocol, know the safety measures for working with corrosive reagents, and you can only handle a small set of samples at a time. Microwave ashing. It is an expensive equipment to obtain, but you can do wet ashing and you can do dry ashing. Um, with microwave, analysis time could be 20 to 40 minutes rather than hours. And uh, you can operate under pressure. By operating under pressure, the boiling point of the acid is higher. Therefore, you can um, use less corrosive acids. So you can use H2SO4 and nitric acid and then don't, they don't boil off fast. So there will be more efficient digestion. And you can run multiple samples at a time, especially if you have a unit like this. So here you can run up to 40 samples um, in this microwave. And you can also pressurize the unit so that you will have reduced amount of time, more efficient digestion. This is for, uh, it's not, it's open, it's not under pressure. And usually you can run two samples at a time, but you use it when you have, you want to process large number of sample, large sample amount. So microwave dry ashing, it's not an official method, but it, 
it was validated to official methods and it works just as well. 20 to 40 minutes, you can get a total, you can get an ASH value and you can get percent ASH. All right, so we ran out of time. I want you to think about these and write them in your, keep the paper and bring them with you next time. We'll go over it next time and you, you turn in the paper next time for a plus two, okay? All right, don't forget, this is for you to work on for Friday. Somebody, Sam came in. Uh, he was in earlier. He went off to the bathroom. Uh, so I have Sam. It was key time. I usually see. Okay, so I'm going to use your pen yep. really quick. Put E for Megan. Yep. Poor thing. Yeah, I know. Ted is missing. Marissa is missing. Haley, there. Okay. Thank you.